Succession planning is the basis for a company dealing successfully with staffing changes such as retirements, transfers, promotions, and turnover. Succession planning is the process of preparing for inevitable vacancies in the organization's hierarchy. It involves more than simply replacement planning. Replacement planning usually involves creating a list of temporary replacements for important jobs, especially during crisis situations. Succession planning should include a well-designed development system for employees since it takes advantage of two or three years to develop a qualified successor. Succession planning follows five logical steps. These steps include, first, integrate with strategy, second, involve top management, third, assess key talent, fourth, follow development practices, and fifth, monitor and evaluate. Let's take a look at each. All of the work involved in succession planning should result in two outcomes. First, identification of potential emergency replacements for critical positions, and second, other successors who will be ready with some additional development. When it comes to integrating with strategy, ask these questions. What competencies will be needed? What jobs will be critical? How should critical positions be filled? And are international assignments required? When involving top management, ask, what is the CEO's role in succession planning? Are high-level executives involved? Are top executives mentoring others? And is there accountability for succession goals? When it comes to assessing key talent, ask, does the employee have important competencies? What's missing? Do assessments provide useful information? Are results examined to determine talents? And are individuals and career goals compatible? Follow development practices and ask, how can important competencies be developed? Can an individual interact with executives? Can talent pools be created for top-level jobs? And what are the incentives for development? When you monitor and evaluate, ask, are multiple metrics used? Are successors effective after placement? Are positions filled internally? Are positions filled externally? And is the process viewed favorably? The individuals identified as possible successors should be told what specific development they need and possible action steps to build their competencies. Succession planning is the process of preparing for inevitable vacancies in organizational hierarchies. Succession planning decisions require the following analysis. How can you identify and classify current talent? How should you make or buy talent? And how can you measure systemic success? Organizations can be proactive in identifying the right managers and employees needed for successful succession planning. Managers determine if individuals are ready, willing, and able to perform duties at a higher level in the organization. Leaders should also take a current inventory of the talent that is already employed in the organization. A common framework is the nine box talent grid as shown here. The nine box talent grid is a matrix showing past performance and future potential of all employees. Since focusing only on potential or performance may provide too narrow a view when developing succession plans for jobs and identifying candidates, a two-dimensional grid can outline individuals' potential to be promoted on one axis and current job performance on the other. Such a talent inventory grid is particularly helpful in jobs that tend to be more complex. The nine box talent grid is therefore useful in assessing potential candidates on both important measures. Some organizations measure the impact of succession planning. A wide range of metrics are used depending on the company's priorities. The appropriate metrics should be selected early in the succession planning process. Key measures a company might consider are the reduced costs of turnover, higher performance, and organizational profitability. Organizations might also track how job vacancies are filled, the availability and readiness of candidates, and success rates of individuals who are promoted. The expansion of information technology capabilities has resulted in employers being able to make succession planning data available electronically to all staff members. Skills tracking systems, performance appraisals, and other databases can be linked to succession plans. Succession planning can be an important way to identify employees who have the current skills or the potential to develop those skills that can help them move up in the organization or on to other positions. As organizations become larger, the benefits of formal succession planning become greater, and for those larger companies, formal succession planning is recommended. 
Key benefits of succession planning include the following. Having a supply of highly qualified individuals ready for future job openings. Succession planning also provides career opportunities and plans for individuals, which helps retention and performance motivation. It also provides a basis for the continual review of staffing requirements as organizational changes occur over time. Succession planning also enhances the brand of the company and establishes the organization as a desirable place to work. It also generates confidence for investors and other stakeholders. But focusing only on the CEO or other top management succession is one of the most common mistakes made in succession planning. Other mistakes include the following. Starting too late when openings are already occurring. Not effectively linking succession plans to strategic plans. Allowing the CEO to direct the planning and make all succession decisions and looking only internally for succession candidates. Actions such as career planning and development follow from succession planning efforts. Organization-centered career planning focuses on identifying career paths that provide for the logical progression of people between jobs in an organization. A good career planning program includes elements of talent management, performance appraisals, developmental activities, transfer and promotion opportunities, and succession planning. To communicate with employees about opportunities and help them with planning, employers frequently use career workshops, a career center, and career counseling. Individual managers often play the role of coach and counselor in their direct contact with individual employees and within the HR-designed career management system. The approach an organization uses to enhance careers should provide opportunities for individual growth and development. For example, organizations now favor using career lattices comprised of multidirectional job changes and lateral moves as mechanisms for providing employees important career experiences. Employees need to know their strengths and weaknesses, which they often discover through company-sponsored assessments. Career paths represent employees' movements through opportunities over time. Although most career paths are thought of as leading upwards, good opportunities also exist in cross-functional or horizontal directions. Unfortunately, less than half of the respondents to a recent survey said that their employers outline career paths for them. An organization's career path tends to follow the hierarchical structure of the organization chart and not evolve to include more innovative ways for employees to move through jobs. Employees are often left on their own, which can result in frustration and disappointment. Showing employees possible routes to fulfillment can lead to better retention and more satisfied workers. Organizational changes have altered career paths for many people. Individuals have had to face career transitions. In other words, they've had to find new jobs. These transitions have emphasized the importance of individual center career planning, which focuses on an individual's responsibility for a career rather than organizational needs. Individuals behave more like free agents who have to move between opportunities they view as helping to further their own goals. Career planning involves several steps that provide an individual with the information needed to create a logical career path. The planning process is not always linear. Individuals may complete one or two steps and discover they need to cycle back to an earlier step and then move forward again. The primary steps in the career planning process are, first, determine who you are, second, find out how you're viewed, third, investigate your options, fourth, create a plan, and fifth, take action and advance your plan. First, individuals need to determine who they are. Individuals need to think about what interests them, what they do well, their work style, and what's important to them. Career advisors use many tools to help people understand themselves. Next, find out how you're viewed. Employees need feedback on how they're doing, how their bosses see their capabilities, and where they fit in organizational plans for the future. One source of this information is performance feedback and also career development discussions. Consulting with trusted colleagues both on and off the job shed light on how others view the individual's capabilities, strengths, and weaknesses. Next, investigate your options. Learning about the industry, the organization, and the specific vocation are important so that career plans can be made within the context of possibilities. The Bureau of Labor Statistics updates the Occupational Outlook Handbook and makes it available online. 
This is a helpful resource that projects demands for particular skills and careers in the future. Set a goal and create an overall plan. After compiling all of the information in the preceding steps, establish a long-term goal with interim short-term milestones. Take into account current levels of competence and performance along with interests and values. An important consideration is the demands that a desired job may place on one's personal life, for example, relocation or hardship of work schedule. Realistic goals are more practical than attractive and unreachable goals. Determine what steps will be necessary to obtain the experiences and skills needed to advance. Finally, take action and advance the plan. Taking action is a critical final step. Setting up a career discussion with one's supervisor, enrolling in seminars, continuing education or other types of programmed learning, or requesting to be assigned to special project or tasks are all proactive steps to get the career path underway. A useful starting point in career planning is to assess interests, personality, skills, and values. Let's take a look. An individual can compile a profile that reflects his or her unique constellation of characteristics. This profile will help determine what types of career options are most likely to lead to success and satisfaction. People tend to pursue careers that match their interests. Interests tend to be fairly stable over time and they are reasonably valid as a predictor of job success and satisfaction. Interest assessments operate on the premise that individuals with similar interests are drawn to similar career fields. Identifying one's interests informs career decisions and focuses individuals on the types of jobs that would be most rewarding. Skills represent the ability to do some task well. Individuals have distinct capabilities that make them especially well suited to particular jobs. A common categorization of skills includes basic skills, complex problem solving skills, resource management skills, social skills, system skills, and technical skills. Skills can be developed and improved over time with focus and practice. An employee's personality includes that individual's personal orientation, like extroversion, openness to experience and conscientiousness, and personal needs, including affiliation, power and achievement needs. Individuals with certain personality attributes find greater success in clusters of occupations that match their personality profile. Work values are often an underappreciated aspect of good career choices. Values act as an individual's compass as they guide behavior and focus effort. If an individual's values are poorly matched to the employer, then job dissatisfaction is likely to occur. Identifying beliefs and ideas that are personally important allows people to live and work authentically and in harmony with their own true selves. Creating a career profile that includes interests, personalities, skills, and values brings into focus the core of an individual's temperament and work style. Like assembling a jigsaw puzzle, the creation of this profile answers questions about what type of career will match the person's strengths, weaknesses, and natural tendencies. People are most productive and happy when their work lines up well with their overall makeup. Internally, organizations define career progression by positions, titles, or levels within the company. The first half of life is typically devoted to the quest for competence and a way to make your mark in the world. Happiness during this time comes primarily from achievement and the acquisition of capabilities. The second half of career life is different. The previous focus on skill mastery changes to the pursuit of integrity, values, and well-being. Representative of this life pattern is the idea that careers and lives are not predictably linear, rather they're cyclical. Individuals experience periods of high stability followed by transition periods of less stability and include inevitable discoveries, disappointments, and triumphs. These cycles of structure and transition occur throughout individuals' lives and careers. This cyclical view may be especially useful perspective for individuals affected by downsizing or early career plateaus in large organizations. Such a perspective underscores the importance of flexibility in an individual's career. It also emphasizes the importance of individuals continuing to acquire more and diverse KSAs. Career progression effort establishes greater ownership over individual development and facilitates empowerment. A career transition is the period during which an individual is changing roles or changing their orientation to a role they already hold. Thus, the term transition suggests both a process of change and a period during which the change is taking place. 
Of particular interest to organizations are three specific times of career transitions, organizational entry, job loss, and retirement. Starting as a new employee can be overwhelming. Entry shock is especially difficult for younger, new hires who find the world of work very different from school. Entry shock includes the following concerns. The boss-employee relationship is different from the student-teacher relationship. In school, feedback is frequent and measurable, but that's not true of most jobs. School has short quarter or semester time cycles, whereas time horizons are much longer at work. And finally, problems are more tightly defined at school. At work, the logical and political aspects of solving work problems are often less certain. Job loss as a career transition has been most associated with downsizing, mergers, and acquisitions. Losing a job is a stressful event in one's career, frequently causing depression, anxiety, and nervousness. The financial implications and the effects on family can be extreme as well. Yet many individuals do face the potential of job loss, and effectively addressing their concerns should be considered in career transition decision making. Unplanned job loss is one reason individuals should adopt a perspective of lifelong learning and maintain their skills. Career development for people at the end of their careers can be managed in many ways. Phased retirement, consulting assignments, and callback of some retirees as needed all act as means of gradual disengagement between the organization and individual. However, phased retirement is complicated by pension laws, which often restrict the number of hours employees who are receiving a pension can work. All in all, development is an important ingredient in the success of career transitions. A career is an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress. Technical and professional workers such as engineers, scientists, and IT systems experts present a special challenge for organizations. Many of these individuals want to stay in their technical areas rather than enter management, yet advancement in many organizations requires a move into management. Most of these people like the idea of the responsibility and opportunity associated with advancement, but they do not want to leave the professional and technical activities at which they excel. Further, the skills required in management roles are very different than those needed in these technical jobs. An attempt to solve this problem is the dual career ladder, a system that allows a person to advance through either management or a technical professional ladder. Dual career ladders are now used at many firms, most commonly in technology-driven industries such as pharmaceuticals, chemicals, computers, and electronics. A specific concern affecting women is the glass ceiling, the situation in which women fail to progress into top and senior management positions. Nationally, women hold about half the managerial professional positions, but only about 10 to 15% of corporate officer positions. Inflexible benefits about women's roles and placement in the workplace are some of the possible causes of this gap. As the number of women in the workforce continues to increase, particularly in professional careers, so does the number of dual career couples. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that more than 80% of all couples are dual career couples. Many members of dual career couples are both employed in management, professional, and technical jobs. Problem areas for dual career couples include family issues and job transfers that require relocation. Global career management can be even more complex than domestic talent management. The movement of managers and employees can be challenging because corporate policies and cultural characteristics in different countries are often dissimilar, and individual expectations about the success of global assignments can vary greatly, thus affecting motivation and commitment. Successful organizations develop a culture that facilitates the movement of talent globally and improves retention. The issue of repatriation is a process that involves planning and training for the reassignment of global employees back to their home countries. After expatriates return home, they often no longer receive the special compensation packages they had been available to them during their assignments. The result is they may feel a net decrease in total income, even if they receive promotions and pay increases. Development is about the efforts to improve employees' abilities to handle a variety of assignments and to cultivate their capabilities beyond those required by the current job.
Development involves efforts to improve employees' abilities to handle a variety of assignments and to cultivate their capabilities beyond those required by the current job. Development differs from training. It is possible to train people to answer customer service questions, drive a truck, enter data in a computer system, set up a drill press, or assemble a television. However, development in such areas as judgment, responsibility, decision-making, and communication presents a bigger challenge. These areas may or may not develop through individuals' ordinary life experiences. There's a close link between learning and development. For most people, lifelong learning and development are necessary and desirable. For many professionals, lifelong learning may mean meeting continuing education requirements to retain certifications. Assistance needed from employers for lifelong development typically comes through programs at work, including tuition reimbursement programs and the like. Whether due to a desire for a career change or because the employer needs different capabilities, people reinvent their careers in middle or mid-career. These job shifters need to develop capabilities in a new field that holds promise for a productive future. Commonly referred to as second acts, employees who make major changes from one career field to another often need some assistance from an employer to close the gap in their skills. Like employee training, employee development begins with an analysis of the needs of both the organization and the individuals within that organization. The goal, of course, is to identify strengths and weaknesses to determine the focus of development. Methods that organizations use to assess development needs include assessment centers, psychological testing, and performance appraisals. Determining the best approach to individual development depends in part on the individual's level of development. Collections of test instruments and exercises designed to diagnose an individual's development needs are referred to as assessment centers. Organizations can use assessment centers for both developing and selecting managers. Employers use assessment centers for a wide variety of jobs. Assessment centers provide an excellent means for determining individual potential in an unbiased manner. Psychological tests have been used for years to determine employees' developmental potential and needs. Intelligence tests, verbal and mathematical reasoning tests, and personality tests are often given. Psychological testing can provide useful information about individuals, motivation, reasoning ability, leadership style, interpersonal response trait, and job preferences. Well-done performance appraisals can be a great source of development information. Performance data on productivity, employee relations, job knowledge, and other relevant dimensions can be gathered in such assessments. In this context, appraisals designed for the development purposes may be different or more useful in aiding individual employee development than appraisals designed strictly for administrative purposes. Development of human resources is all about finding the right strategy to help better your people. Development involves efforts to improve employees' abilities to handle a variety of assignments and to cultivate their capabilities beyond those required by the current job. The oldest on-the-job development technique is coaching, a collaborative process focused on improving individual performance. The coach and the person being coached create shared success through a series of ongoing conversations. The process relies on the coach serving as a facilitator rather than an evaluator. Questions that encourage the employee to self-reflect and assess his or her own performance are the basis for coaching interactions. Trust is the underlying foundation of coaching. A coach who demonstrates genuine interest and commitment to the employee creates an environment in which success can occur. Assigning promising employees to important committees may broaden their experiences and help them understand their personalities, issues, and processes governing the organization. The process of moving a person from job to job is called job rotation, and it's widely used as a development technique. When properly handled, such job rotation fosters a greater understanding of the organization and improves employee retention by making individuals more versatile, strengthening their skills, and reducing boredom. Progressive organizations may use corporate universities or organizational universities to develop managers and other employees. Participation does not usually result in a degree, accreditation, or graduation. 
A related alternative are partnerships between companies and traditional universities, which can occur where the universities design and teach specific courses for employees. Development of human resources is all about finding the right strategy to help better your people. Development involves efforts to improve employees' abilities to handle a variety of assignments and to cultivate their capabilities beyond those required by the current job. Most off-the-job development programs include some classroom instruction. People are familiar with classroom training, which gives it an advantage of being widely accepted. But the lecture system sometimes used in classroom instruction encourages passive listening and reduced learner participation, which is a distinct disadvantage. Sometimes trainees have little opportunity to question, clarify, and discuss the lecture material. The effectiveness of classroom instruction depends on multiple factors, group size, trainees' abilities, instructors' capabilities and styles, and the subject matter. Organizations often send employees to externally sponsored seminars or professional courses, such as those offered by numerous professional and consulting groups. Organizations also encourage continuing education by reimbursing employees for the cost of college courses. Tuition reimbursement programs provide incentives for employees to study for advanced degrees through evening and weekend classes they attend outside their regular work days and hours. Some organizations send executives and managers to experiences held outdoors, called outdoor training or outdoor experiential activities. The rationale for using these wilderness excursions, which can last for several days, is that such experiences can increase self-confidence and help individuals reevaluate personal goals and efforts. For individuals in work groups or teams, shared risks and challenges outside the office environment can create a sense of teamwork. A sabbatical is an opportunity that some organizations provide for employees to take time off the job to develop and rejuvenate, as well as to participate in activities that help others. Some employers provide paid sabbaticals, while others allow employees to take unpaid sabbaticals. The length of time away varies greatly. Development of human resources is all about finding the right strategy to help better your people. Leadership development is about expanding a person's capability to be effective in leadership roles. Common ways to help individuals transition successfully into leadership roles include modeling, coaching, mentoring, and executive education. A common adage in management development says that managers tend to manage as they were managed. In other words, managers learn by behavior modeling or copying someone else's behavior. Management development efforts can take advantage of a natural human behavior by matching young or developing managers with positive models and then reinforcing the desirable behaviors exhibited by the learners. The modeling process involves more than straightforward imitation or copying. Effective leadership coaching requires patience and good communication skills. Like modeling, it complements the natural way humans learn. An outline of good coaching pointers will often include the following. Explain appropriate behaviors, make clear why actions were taken, accurately state observations, provide possible alternatives and suggestions, and follow up and reinforce positive behaviors used. Leadership coaching is a specific application of coaching. Organizations may use outside experts as executive coaches to help managers improve leadership skills. Sometimes these experts help deal with problematic management styles. Research on the effectiveness of leadership coaching suggests that coaching can be beneficial in dealing with chronic stress, psychological difficulties, and even physiological problems faced by executives and managers. A method called management mentoring employs a relationship in which experienced managers aid individuals in their earlier stages of their careers. Such a relationship provides an environment by conveying technical, interpersonal, and organizational skills from a more experienced person to a designated, less experienced individual. Not only does the inexperienced employee benefit, but the mentor may also enjoy having the opportunity and challenge of sharing wisdom. Executives in an organization often face difficult jobs because of changing or unknown circumstances. Churning at the top of organizations and the stress of executive jobs contribute to the increased turnover in these positions. In an effort to decrease that turnover and increase management development capabilities, organizations are using specialized education for executives. 
Management development is a special focus in many organizations, including supervisor development and leadership development. Management modeling, coaching, and mentoring are valuable parts of management development efforts.